Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Tren, and as a third year member of the LACPA President's Advisory Committee on Women in the Legal Profession Subcommittee on Gender Bias and Civility, I am proud and excited to be bringing you another installment of our recorded oral history series. The purpose of the oral history series is to share the stories of women attorneys who have experienced or witnessed gender bias and instances of incivility and who have successfully addressed or navigated around such issues in their own lives. In addition to discussing their own paths, they will offer their insights on what progress, if any, they think the profession has made and what further steps the legal field should take to combat gender inequity and ensure equal opportunities and the full participation of women. As for my own personal background, I am a Chinese American from a multi-generational immigrant family who was the first lawyer in her family. I served in the Department of Justice for over 15 years in both the civil and criminal divisions in the US Attorney's Office in LA until recently. As someone who specialized in racketeering gang, drug cartel, money laundering cases, I often led very large investigative teams of very senior law enforcement officers and was the only woman in the room. In 2019, I became the first female chief in office history of my section. Now I am at a large, uh, big law firm as a partner, and I still see too few women uh, and women of color who have made it to partnership. I'm proud to be part of this series because I think it's crucial to amplify the stories of phenomenal women who have made their mark in the world and to share their stories of triumphs and lessons learned. More can and should be done, and it is incumbent on all of us to do our part in ensuring that progress in the legal profession in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion continues. Today, I am so honored to be talking with Laura Farber, who is not only a powerhouse lawyer, but also a very busy trailblazer outside of the courtroom with her deep devotion and commitment to community service. Laura is a partner at Hod and Hod, one of the oldest law firms in Pasadena, as well as a majority woman and minority owned firm, and is a member of the firm's litigation and employment practice groups. She is an accomplished trial lawyer in the areas of employment and commercial litigation and personal injury. She is also a noteworthy leader in many, many organizations. First, for 30 years, Laura has been a member of the American Bar Association, where she has held almost every possible leadership position. To recount every position and leadership role she has served with the ABA would take much longer than the time we have, but as a sampling, she has chaired the Young Lawyers Division, the Commission on Youth at Risk, the Solo Small Firm and General Practice Division, the Latin America and Caribbean Law Initiative Council, and chaired the Program Evaluation and Planning Committee of the Board of Governors and has also served on the Board of Governors as well as its executive committee, various presidential appointments committees, and many other groups, including the Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence. Currently, Laura co-chairs the ABA Coordinating Group on Practice Forward, which complements the task force on legal needs arising out of the 2020 pandemic and since 2016, she has served as a California state delegate to the House of Delegates for the ABA. Laura has also been a volunteer member of the Tournament of Roses since 1993. She was elected to the executive committee in 2012, and over the years, she has served on and chaired various committees, including formation area, decorating places, judging, and membership development. In 2019, Laura became the third female president of the Tournament of Roses and the first Latina, picking the power of hope as the theme for the 2020 Rose Parade. She is currently chairman of the Rose Bowl Management Committee and is also a member of the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation Advisory Board and the Rose Bowl Legacy Foundation Museum Committee. In the community, she serves on the board of directors for the nonprofit classical notes and has actively participated in the Pasadena NAACP's Business Stimulus Committee. Laura graduated from the University of California at Los Angeles with a bachelor's degree in political science 
and attended the Georgetown University Law Center. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time. I don't even know how you have the time to join us uh, today, but it's such an honor for, uh, for you to be here today. I'm honored to be here, Carol, and um, I'm thrilled that this project exists. I think it's meaningful, I think it's important, and I'm happy to contribute in any way that I can. Thank you so much, Laura. Since we have so much to talk about, let's just dive right in. Um, I want to start off, Laura, by talking about your personal and familial background and whether, for example, that might have affected your choice to pursue law and engage in the community uh, service that you clearly so love. So for the benefit of those who don't already know about your family's amazing journey from Argentina to the United States um, and the own uh, sacrifices your parents have made, can you first talk a little bit about that? Of course. Um, I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and actually my entire family is still there, except for obviously my parents and uh, my grandparents who um, immigrated later. Uh, but in any event, my, my parents uh, were students there and in Buenos Aires at the University of Buenos Aires, and they were both studying biochemistry. Most of my family's in the science field. Uh, had I stayed there, I probably would have gone that route too. Anyway, uh, there were some really tumultuous times. And if you know, you read a little bit about the history of Argentina, this is pre-dirty war times, but uh, there was, my dad tells a story about uh, some protests that were taking place that were being planned by the students. And so he was going to a meeting to talk about, with students, to talk about what they were going to do. And my mom was pregnant with me at the time. He was meeting my mom there and my mom, for whatever reason, wasn't there when he got there. So he was kind of not sure what was going on. Anyway, as he's arriving to the classroom, he sees a bunch of police officers with billy clubs and they are literally going after the students, physically going after the students. And so he was incredibly nervous, scared, wondering what the heck was going on. Plus, where was my mom? Turns out my mom wasn't feeling well that day. She had stayed back. Um, and so he said that that was the day that he realized that they, as soon as they possibly could, were going to leave everything and everyone they knew to start a new life. They could not stay in that environment. Imagine students gathering, you know, like here we have the First Amendment, right? Gathering to have conversation and having something like that, horrific. And they were also spraying tear gas, I forgot to mention. So it was just outrageous. Now, we've seen images of things like that, unfortunately, more recently, but they lived through it. And so as soon as they were able, they had a professor friend who knew somebody in Santa Barbara, and they literally came to the US. They left everything and everyone they knew to start a new life with me in tow. And from there, you know, uh, we, we came to this country um, because of what it provided. You know, it, it really gave us hope. And that's kind of where that theme that, I, that you mentioned, the power of hope came from because it really gave us hope for, for freedom, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom to pursue your economic endeavors, freedom to just be you and not be turning your head or worrying, you know, who's going to come, who's going to kidnap people or take people away or do all the horrible things that occurred ensuing, you know, in the dirty war in Argentina. And so, um, you know, the other thing is they, they knew a little bit of English, but not that much. <laughs> And you know, I grew up very bilingual, fortunately. I, my first language was Spanish, and so I learned English at a young age. But they had to learn all the norms, the, you know, the cultural differences and changes, and yet still try to maintain some of that. And I, I am so in awe of my parents and what they were able to do and the life they were able to make because they didn't have anything. I mean, <laughs> to come here and to start from scratch and try to build something. Um, and so many, I'm a proud immigrant, so many people go through things and have compelling stories. And it's so important to recognize that and, and to embrace it um, and, and what it means and how it has helped build the foundation of this country. And you know the, the, the diversity of viewpoints, the diversity of experiences, but the opportunities that exist and how this is viewed even relatively speaking, you know, sometimes we complain about how things are going in this country, which we have a right to do and, and reason to do. But it's always important to also kind of compare and think, wow, what would it be like if I were here or here or another place that has less stability or that has, you know, serious economic and other issues. So I'm very grateful and thankful for that experience, for the fact that they came here and, you know, um, for, for what has ensued. You also asked me, Carol, about the, the legal profession. 
And I did want to mention my grandfather was actually an attorney, a lawyer, very different system in Argentina. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, probably not as honorable in many respects or ethical as, as we would define it, you know, but, but he was really on the up and up. He probably lost a lot of clients because he was trying to resolve disputes um, before they turned into something more serious. Their orality um, tradition was not what it is here. It was more based on writings. And so, you know, I think as we see systems evolve, evolve over Latin America, and I was involved in that with the ABA, the Latin American Caribbean Initiative Law Council and the rule of law issues and, and how um, systems of governance and systems of, of penal code and, and, um, and, you know, access to their justice systems, how those things work. Um, I, I was inspired by my grandfather. Uh, he was the only person in my entire family that wasn't in the science field. And as a result, I, you know, I initially was in science, but decided to go a different route. And I'm so happy that I did because I, I saw that example and how important it is to try to help people. And I think that's a theme that it's probably carried with me, not only in the, the legal profession and my endeavors there, but also in, in the concept of community service. Thank you, Laura, for all that. What an amazing story, both about your parents and the idea of, you know, the, the immigrant story, right? Sort of leaving everything that they knew behind for a better life for themselves and more importantly for their, their child. And um, I'm, I'm, I know, I have no doubt that they're super proud of everything that you've, you've done uh, for um, the legal community and for the communities at large with all of your community service. So you've kind of answered um, a few of my follow-up questions, um, but I wanna give you an opportunity to, to um, you know, expand upon it. So I was gonna ask you, you know, coming from a family with such a science background, you know, whether or not in some ways you were considered the black sheep, you know, not following, you know, your the family profession, so to speak, but you talked a little bit about your grandfather and it's, you know, really um, interesting to hear you talk about his different experiences, you know, being an attorney in another country, because as you said, we all know very different systems and, um, you know, there, there are issues, I think, in, in all countries and, um, you know, we often forget in the United States how, frankly, lucky we are about some of the things that we take for granted. And so in addition to, you know, the very, very strong role models you had, it sounds like, from very early age in your parents, um, in your grandfather, um, any, anybody else you could think of in terms of role models or any events, um, you know, besides the many powerful ones you've already talked about, which, you know, uh, encourage you to go into law as opposed to something else. And then as a follow-up to that, or a, a you know, corollary, there are also, you know, as we all know, too well, unfortunately, societal stereotypes, right. And cultural assumptions about women, uh, and then in particular about women of color, uh, you know, including those for me, you know, of AAPI descent and for you, maybe those who are Latinx. And I'm curious, Laura, you know, in addition to the question and piling on a little bit, but about any other role models or events, whether or not you ever felt the pressure of any societal and cultural stereotypes growing up? And if so, how did you deal with them? Okay, well, let's go with the first question. Um, in terms of role models, uh, my mom and my grandmother clearly in a, uh, and this, I can kind of mix some of what I'm saying to answer kind of both questions in a sense, but, um, you know, Argentina is a, you know, a country with lots of stereotypes, you know, you've got the machismo stereotype, right? So, um, but it's a very well-educated country, which is interesting because for a lot of Latin American countries that doesn't always exist, but that's because education is free. You don't have to pay to go to school or to college. You just have to get in. And so um, my mom and my grandmother, my grandmother for her time, in my view, was a, a trailblazer because she was working. She was a high school biology professor, but she also took care of the family and cooked and cleaned it. She did it all. She was the superwoman. And she started, in my view, for my family, a tradition of strong women, women who were you know, going to pursue a profession and granted um, it, you know, my grandfather did what he could, but I wouldn't call him very uh, domestically oriented <laughs> you know? in the culture. That was the norm. Right. So, you know, she had to do it all. But at least, you know, she had the foresight to raise two daughters, my mom and her sister, with that example. And so my mom also pursued a professional living, 
Um, she studied, she got her PhD in biochemistry, as did my dad. They were in school together. And, you know, initially when we came to this country, it was my dad who was going to, you know, try and do a lot of the work. She was going to do her postdoc, but then, you know, I, she had me and then she, I had two younger brothers. And so she was, you know, trying to do that as well as develop a career, but she ended up doing that as well in the science field. But she was able to start first at the Veterans Administration doing some research because she had a mentor, a male mentor, by the way, and we'll talk about mentors later because I think they come in all shapes, sizes, and genders, and I think that's super important. Um, but she did that, and then eventually she got a position at UCLA as a professor and has been there for a very long time at the Jules Stein Eye Institute doing very important research on a disease called retinitis pigmentosa where people lose their vision, um, a peripheral vision eventually go blind, it's genetic. And she found the gene on the chromosome that causes the disease. I'm very proud of her. And she was a trailblazer, my gosh, the, the politics and the issues that she has had to put up with over her career are really phenomenal. And so I had those examples. And even though I did not pursue science, they were super supportive always of me pursuing whatever I was passionate about and whatever I saw myself being able to, to, to do and to make a difference doing. And so initially physics was my, my love. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but for a short bit. And then I quickly realized this isn't exciting to me. This isn't where my passion is. And so that's where I went into political science. I had done high school debate. So there was some you know sort of past interest in that arguing. And I'd grown up arguing a lot of things and positions, which a lot of us do around the you know dining table with our families. And then I realized I really wanted to, to do this and then pursue the law. Eventually, it, it became very obvious to me that this was an area that I would definitely be passionate about. Now, in terms of the cultural stereotypes and other stereotypes, stereotypes I've touched on some of that already. Um, it, growing up in a culture that does have a sort of um, machismo still, I think, and I think it still exists in Latin America. I really do, even though there's a lot of amazing professional women I know in bar associations sometimes, you know, being not a first class citizen or not treated the same way, not having the same opportunities. I've seen that front and center in some of those bar associations. Uh, I've also seen um, a lot of openness and, and embracing of growth in, in these areas for many people, especially when you talk about, you know, their children, their daughters, their nieces, their granddaughters, and what is the future going to look like and what opportunities should exist. But I think on the cultural side, it's really fascinating to me how, you know, even just looking at the words in Spanish, you know, when I was president of the Tournament of Roses, I always wanted to say presidente, presidente in Spanish, and they would all call me presidenta because that is the right term. Because in Spanish, we use a differential at the end for gender, right? But I was so hell bent on, oh, I want to be presidente, <laughs> you know, just like I want to be chairman of the board, not chairwoman of the board. I don't, you know, those are just little things, but they're things that matter to me. And so I tried really hard to kind of accept and embrace when people would call me that. I wouldn't correct them, even though I really wanted to and say, no, you know, call me this. But, but you know, those are, those are tiny things and they're more recent. I do think there are vestiges of a lot of that still in the expectations and the roles that women are supposed to play as the caregiver, as the one that takes care of the family um, and, usually supports whatever the husband's desired pursuit is, um, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that there isn't room for women to pursue their own thing, but it always has to sort of be complementary of, as opposed to perceived as in competition with, um, as an example, because sometimes that's the stereotype to, oh, you know, why isn't she more supportive of her husband as opposed to, wow, that's great that she's achieving and accomplishing these wonderful things. You know, so you see and feel a little bit of that as well. Um, but for the most part, I mean, at least I feel in my personal family situation, I've had only support for all the endeavors I've pursued, including my amazing husband and my kids and, and everyone else around the table. And my husband's from the Dominican Republic. And so he comes from an interesting tradition as well. Um, but he has, from day one, since I met him, been incredibly supportive, also an attorney. And so I feel very fortunate. And, and that's one thing that will come out as I talk with you, Carol, um, that support systems to me are really crucial. And, you know, if you don't have one, you got to find one. <laughs> because I don't think any of us could do any of what we strive or want to do without that. 
Thank you, Laura, for all that. So I'm, you know, struck by many things that you just said, and I now have done a few of these interviews, and there's always a little bit of a similarity. Oftentimes, a lot of the interviewees um, grew up with very strong female role models, and um, your mom sounds amazing, and you should absolutely be proud of her, and we should all, frankly, um, be proud of her, and, and, you know, trailblazers in any profession. Um, I think, you know, uplift us all. Uh, and so that's great to hear. Uh, and then also, I do want to also talk about something that um, you talked about, which is having mentors. And it's interesting that you also talked about both female and male, because that's also been a running theme. A lot of the interviewees have talked about, you know, having mentors, and not just women, but also having male mentors and sponsors. And we'll talk hopefully a little bit about that and maybe if there's a difference in your mind about mentors and sponsors. And then, the, you know, what struck me was interesting. I love what you talked about in terms of language, right? Because the language, a lot of it is gendered. And I always thought it was funny when people say, you know, I'm a girl boss. I'm like, why don't you just say you're a boss? You know, why girl boss? Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? Some people just like to use those kind of terminologies. But I do think in some ways that sort of buying a little bit into this gendered notions of what it means to be a leader, a president, um, you know, a chair, a chairman, like you said. Um, and so those are all interesting. And I want to hopefully get through all of this and expand further upon it. So now that we've, you know, talked a little bit um, about your amazing personal background and why you um, got into the law, um, you've now been at Han and Han, I think, for almost 30 years. Um, as we talked about, you know, women of color partners are still rare unicorns, unfortunately, even in the year 2022. So I want to talk a little bit, Laura, about your progression from being an associate to making it as um, not only a partner, but a very successful partner. Um, you started off as an associate at a larger, I believe, New York-based firm. And I'm curious, Laura, how your experiences were um, at a uh, at a big law firm like that. And if you can, you know, in answering that, if you can situate us in terms of what time period we're talking about, um, because I want to sort of take us through that and then figure out, you know, what made you decide to pivot to that and go to uh, a place like Hot and Hot. Well, I, I graduated in 1990 from Georgetown uh, University Law Center, and I uh, started to work at, Dewey. it was then called Dewey Ballantyne. Uh, it eventually became Dewey LaBeouf, um, but I wasn't there when it became Dewey LaBeouf. Um, so I started there in the fall um, of 1990, because I graduated in uh, May or June, sat for the bar, uh, fortunately passed the bar and waved into DC. I had to have that DC uh, connection because my husband was barred in DC actually. And um, uh, he was practicing law uh, already. He, he had, he was a lawyer before I was. And so I, I came out here uh, to start work for them. And I was working in the litigation group. It was a big New York firm with a smaller LA office, about 40 lawyers. So it was a branch office. And so, you know, there were issues of autonomy and many people go through this, I think, that work at a branch of a firm that's based somewhere else because the main office is New York. So it had a New York sort of style and mentality and culture. And so, um, but what I liked is I felt like I was getting the best of both worlds because it was a big firm. And yet I didn't feel like I was in a big office because it was about 40 lawyers. So, so mid-size, I mean, I wouldn't say small, but definitely smaller than where they were. And, um, and so, you know, I got opportunities. I got assignments. Interestingly, uh, there were all kinds of people there, and most of my mentors were men. Um, I did have a few women, and then I had a, a more senior associate who, for a while, was wonderful, and um, later on was maybe not so wonderful. <laughs> um, I don't want to, I'm obviously not going to get into names or anything, but I think part of it was maybe I was encringing or infringing a little more on the possible role that she played in, in the team that was comprised of her and a, another a male partner. And I mean, these are all my speculative things at this point, looking back. Um, but regardless, I pushed through, I worked my you know tail off and did everything I needed to do. But I realized one day when I had a motion to continue a trial dropped on me at fr on a Friday, at, I want to say at like 5 p.m., told that it was due on Monday when it had sat on a partner's desk for probably a week, that I was being tested and I was being 
you know, observed in terms of my commitment and whether I would just toss everything else to the wind and come in and work exclusively on that on the weekend and, you know, do all the things that you're supposed to do. Um, FaceTime, you know, walk around the office, even though you don't have any more work around 7 p.m. to let people know that you're available for work if they have it so they see you, things of that nature. Um, you know, I just, I realized it just, there's got to be more than this. Plus, I really wanted to be involved in the community. And I think there was support for me doing my bar stuff, but it was more like on my time. In other words, fit it in where you can, but you have to, you know, do all of this. And I'm not sure how valued it was. And I, I'm not, I mean, I'm somewhat generalizing because there were some people that were amazing. I'm, I'm not at all saying that wasn't the case, but I just think the work environment, and I wasn't there long. I was only there a couple of years, but I think I, I did have a mentor in the Women Lawyers Association. I was very, at that time, and Walala, I had fortunately joined, and she was phenomenal. She would, she is working at a mid-sized firm, and she and I would have conversations, and she said, you know, Laura, I think there might be a better fit for you at a different place. And I happen to know the hiring partner. He's a former partner of mine. And so I'm thinking I'll introduce you. And it was Han and Han. And, um, and so I was just so fortunate because this firm was very, very committed to community service, but not just saying it. They actually not only encouraged it, they expected it. So it was a very different model. And I think that's what really convinced me that I really need to think about working somewhere different where what I want to do in the community and, and, and interested in doing will be supported and embraced and um, celebrated in a different way. And that's not to say that it wouldn't have been celebrated, I think, at Dewey. I just think it was, it was just a different mindset, a different approach. And I preferred the approach that Han and Han had because number one, they were a very old law firm. 1899, I mean, that's, that's pretty old um, and very stable and smaller. And so I felt like it was just going to be a better fit, a shorter partnership track, of course. I mean, that, you know, those things factor in as well uh, because I didn't know, you know, having seen the partnership track, I wasn't convinced that it was getting shorter. I think it might've been getting longer at the time and people that even got to that point weren't necessarily making partners. So, I mean, there's just so many different dynamics that I think that occur and, and that are legitimately happening in, in different work environments. So I was fortunate enough to get an offer after two years at Dewey and I made the move. Um, interestingly, one of the partners at Dewey knew Han and Han very well because he had gotten an offer as a summer associate and he didn't take it. He ended up going to Dewey and he said to me, you know, Laura, I'm a little envious because I sometimes wonder if I should have, you know, taken that offer. So it was just one of those fun moments and interesting stories, but they were, it was so gracious, all the people that worked there. And I think it changed dramatically when it became Dewey LaBeouf and, and the firm changed. There was a lot of turnover and a lot of, you know, personalities and stuff. And I tried to stay in touch with as many people that I could, um, some of whom are now on the bench, which is awesome. But, you know, it is what it is. A wonderful experience. I credit that as my foundation. I had so many opportunities as a newer associate to you know take depositions and do arbitrations and things that at, at, as a first and second year you would have never expected or imagined that you could do that at a large law firm so i do credit dewey for allowing me and supporting me and letting me do those kind of things and have those kinds of experiences so i i, I really did have a lot of amazing positive you know things that happened as a result of dewey but also some opportunities and challenges and learning moments and growing moments that got me to where I am now. And I've never looked back. I've been thrilled to work at this law firm. It has been so incredible uh, and how we have evolved. And Carol, we are now a certified woman and minority owned law firm. <laughs> Who would have figured? I mean, when I joined, that was definitely not the case. I think I was probably the third woman there, third or fourth woman. Our first woman, Susan House is now retired, but she was the first, she was our trailblazer. And, and so we didn't have very many. We didn't, I think I had one woman associate when I joined. So um, I, I now, I mean, I'm at a place where it's majority women. I, I mean, who, who would have ever thought about some of these things? So I gotta tell you, it's been incredible. I feel blessed, I feel, I feel fortunate. And I know a lot of people change firms, you know, in their careers, some more often than others. I am so happy that I've been able to stay at the same place since 1992 um, and not even think about going anywhere else. And I think that's because of the approach, the philosophy and the support that I've received.
So Laura, so that's all uh, amazing. And like you said, first of all, you know, the fact that you um, made partner after two years being at Han and Han, I think is a testament um, to everything that um, all of your abilities and that is really hard to do. And so um, for all of the um, attorneys, like particularly the younger ones who would be watching this um, art, this interview today, what would you say to them? So you talked about, you know, having pretty unprecedented experiences um, as a associate at Dewey, but I'm sure they didn't just fall into your lap, right? Some of it a little bit is probably luck, you know, but a lot of it is, uh, I would think, fortitude and pushing to get those opportunities. So how would you, you know, what would you, um, what advice would you give to the associates, whether it is, you know, especially at a large law firm, how do they push for those opportunities? How do they get seen, you know, and get visible, high visible uh, assignments, roles, uh, and, and then, you know, whether at a big law firm, but especially at a big law firm, but also, you know, at a um, any kind of law firm that they're at, how and how did you, um, you know, get, become partner? I know it's through a lot of hard work, clearly, but any other tips and advice you would give um, to anybody else out there? Sure. I think you have to be your own advocate. And a lot of times we are, you know, we're afraid or, we, or there are stereotypes preventing us from feeling like we can really be an advocate, but you, you have to be an advocate. You can't stay silent. You can't um, watch your male peers, you know, get opportunities and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. How come they're all getting these opportunities and I'm not getting these opportunities? You need to speak up. I think it's really important if you're able to find someone, whoever that someone is, male, female, doesn't matter, but somebody that believes in you, that can help you advocate so that it's not just you advocating, but can also point out opportunities, point out, hey, you know, I've got this new matter. Maybe you want to be involved because they know you or you've had a chance to work with them. And if you're working with somebody who's not doing that, then maybe you need to find someone else. And there are ways to do that without you know, cutting ties and jeopardizing. And I think it's, it's part of just, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go reach out to XYZ partner and say, you know, I'd love to have some advice from you. Could, could we go to lunch and can we sit down and talk? You know, I want to talk about my career. Partners love that you stroke their egos. They are in heaven. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I need your advice. I need your help. I need your guidance. And the minute you do that, I mean, and you're not, you want, might not click with every single person and that's okay. But you will, I believe, you will click with someone if you keep trying and looking. And once that clicks, you now have the opportunity to have someone that's not necessarily working with you yet. It could be someone you're working with or maybe not, but at least they see a side of you and get to know you personally and become sort of your trusted advisor. And lo and behold, that many times turns into the person that's, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's an opportunity here, or I've heard of this, or I thought, even if it's not working directly with them. And that's a, a method that for me has worked consistently, consistently everywhere I've gone. I mean, I've, got, I've, gone to, I've been in two work environments, but, but it's been something that I've also heard many of my peers and many others, especially in the American Bar Association, where we talk, um, not just in, in firms in LA and California, but in firms all over the country, about experiences and how people have approached these areas. And I, I'm firmly of the belief that you need to take the initiative and you need to create those opportunities. They're not going to just fall into your lap, I believe. Now, you may have some if you're, if you, you know, the serendipity and all the stars align and all of that, but, but you need to make your experiences what they are. And if you, if you don't own that, and pursue that, it's going to become much more challenging and difficult for it to happen. And so that's to me the, the, the most, almost the most important advice I can give is be your own advocate. Now, the second piece is be authentic. If you try to be someone you're not, number one, people see through it. And number two, you won't have that connection. You won't have that, um, that those aha moments or those, those really wonderfully supportive working relationships because people will think she's not real, she's not being herself or she's not really pursuing things that matter to her or that are genuine. And so 
you've got to be yourself. And that includes your style and your approach to things. And so I know that by working with a variety of people, you get drips and drabs and pieces from each of them to help mold you and who you are and who you want to be. You know, you'll pick up, oh, I like the way this person writes. I like this approach, or I like the way this person speaks in public or their ad, you know, advocacy skills here, or I like their commitment to X, Y, whatever it is, you slowly develop your style and your authentic voice. And that comes through in everything that you do. Um, so those are the things that I would focus on. And then the third one that I think is crucial, Carol, is find a niche, whatever that niche is. And I include community service in that niche because if it's something that's gonna make you stand out and be different, that is huge. Because now, oh, they think of this and oh, Laura's in that space or Carol's in that space or whomever is, oh yeah, we, you know, you become a person that's that's known for X or known for Y or or you know, is, is interested in X or Y, or is becoming skilled, like you're reading up extra and you're really trying to learn an area or whatever it is. I think um, that's hugely important. And same with the community service piece, because they'll remember, oh, she did, I was involved with the domestic violence project at the LA County Bar, for example, doing pro bono you know, temporary restraining orders at a very early age and going and advocating for these people. Well, hey, now I've developed something that my brethren didn't have. I've gone to court, I've gotten opportunities, you know, whatever it is. So try and pursue those opportunities. There's also the TAP program where you get training to go try criminal cases from the Bar Association. You need to find those opportunities. If you want to get into court and you're not getting in the court because cases aren't going to court or you're not able to second chair or third chair or whatever it is with a partner, um, then create those opportunities because they exist. Laurel, what great pieces of advice. Uh, I especially love uh, your first point, which is to be an advocate for yourself. Isn't it funny that um, some of the best attorneys, they can be such powerful advocates for their clients, and yet when it comes to themselves, and I find that with a lot of particularly with women, right? I think we've sort of been raised to, you know, put your head down and work really hard and somehow somebody will notice you. That doesn't really happen in, in real life, right? Um, so you talked about being authentic and I wanted to just ask you this. I was curious, um, you know, there's like the stereotype, right? Like in order to uh, do well in at a law, law firm, especially, um, that you have to, for example, learn how to play golf. Uh, in order to, you know, hang out with uh, partners, especially the male partners. So I'm curious, Laura, as a very successful partner, um, you know, not, I'm not going to ask you whether you play golf or not, but do you find sort of in terms of how you network, uh, develop business, is it a little bit different from how you see some of your male partners and colleagues doing it? Um, do women have to, um, you know, do things a little bit differently? You know. It's an interesting question, Carol. I know, and, and by the way, I don't play golf. Um, I have colleagues that have played golf. I have colleagues that haven't, both men and women, by the way. Um, I think you have to do whatever you're comfortable doing, but you have to find a way to connect with people. And sometimes it's just, you know, taking people to lunch, taking people to dinner, um, being involved in Bar association activities, I think, can be really, really wonderful because, you know, you, other lawyers are not necessarily competition. <laughs> Many of them turn into referral sources. That's been my experience, especially when I left Dewey and went to a smaller firm. And sometimes they're conflicted out. You know, we'll take your breadcrumbs, you know, for a big firm, perhaps. And I say breadcrumbs because maybe the hourly rate, you know, is ours is lower and so, you know, they, they couldn't handle that client because the hourly rate's too high or, you know, whatever it is. But the, the key is, Carol, to, to get out and do what you're comfortable doing. And sometimes you're meeting your client at their place, whatever that place is, uh, finding out what they enjoy doing. It doesn't have to be golf. I mean, it could be, let's do a cooking class together or let's go do, let's uh, do flower arranging. Those are more stereotypical. Doesn't have to be that stuff either. Um, I've done bowling. I've done, you know, I've just a variety of different things, whatever it is. Uh, it, you know, I think that the connection is the key and the relationship is the key and making it and maintaining it in whatever manner you can. And I, when I say that, I'm not just talking about clients. I'm talking about other lawyers. I'm talking about 
partners at your firm, if you're an associate, you've got to treat them like they're a client. You've got to make time. You've got to make sure you're touching base. You've got to show interest. And then I have found, Carol, that community involvement, you know, my firm, Han and Han, has been big on it, as I mentioned to you earlier. That has been an incredible business development opportunity. You know, whether it's my kids that played AYSO and other parents at the AYSO soccer match, right, or basketball match, whatever that was, or I'm involved in a nonprofit and all of a sudden I'm meeting a variety of different people and I get phone calls. Uh, you know, someone has a client or has a relationship or has someone who's a brother or sister of such and such that needs help. You will find opportunities in so many different places. You just have to get out there. And, you know, sometimes you're so busy with getting the work done that you're not able to make the time and prioritize how to learn to develop business. And a lot of partners won't, I'm gonna be honest, a lot of partners aren't gonna spend the energy mentoring you on developing business. Some others are really good about it and will introduce you to clients or take you places. Sometimes you have to insert yourself, but getting out there, getting into, and, and when I say that, you know, let's say you love animals, go join the Humane Society, get involved in the Humane Society, or you love um, advocating it like this group that I'm involved with, Classical Notes is really big on cultural and musical experiences. I love music. So that was a nonprofit that made sense to me. Well, I got involved with them. Or for me, it was the American Bar Association. I think a professional organization is also really, really great. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be um, the ABA, but it can be. It can be the LA County Bar. It can be Wallala. It can be the Latina Lawyers Association. Um, a specialty bar associations can be another different way to network, which I think can be super helpful. So there's so many different approaches, so many ways to do this. Um, I think it really, it really depends on what you feel comfortable with, but you gotta get out. I love that. Thank you, Laura. So I do want to talk about community service because obviously you've devoted a great amount of your uh, time and passion to it. And when I talk about community service, um, I'm sort of lumping it generically, both um, you know, nonprofit organizations, some of the ones you just talked about, uh, but also professional bar associations, right? Because uh, ABA, for example, they do obviously um, a lot for the legal profession and you've been so involved in it that um, I'm very curious about your perspective about the legal profession um, because of all of the leadership roles you've had at the ABA. So first of all, um, you know, to bounce off of your last point, how did, there's so many different professional bar associations, right, Laura, and you've described, you've sort of listed some of them. How did you choose to get involved in the ABA? Um, and you, you know, I've said this to you, I think, before we started this interview, um, you have been involved in a few organizations for a really long time, 20, 30 years, um, which I find very rare. Um, a lot of people sort of bounce around different organizations. And so, you know, how did you first choose ABA? Um, and then I want to talk a little bit further after that about um, some of your specific experiences and perspectives as a result of being in, in the ABA. Well, I got involved in the ABA um, through the LA County Bar. I was um, president of the Barristers, which was the young lawyer group from, you know, from the LA County Bar. And we at the time were attending ABA meetings to, to learn about other young lawyer groups and affiliates throughout the country. And I was actually, uh, I had put together a program called Diversity on the Bench. And I had worked with a lot of uh, specialty bars and affiliate bars to, you know, to co-sponsor and put it together. And it was selected by the ABA to, for me to do a presentation at one of their national conferences about this program so they could replicate it. And so I attended my first ABA meeting in, I wanna say it was 1994, and it was in Portland, Oregon, on behalf of the LA County Bar. And I was sold. At that point, I just, I went and I said, oh my gosh, I am meeting lawyers from all over the country who are like me, who are situated in this, similar situation in terms of, you know, years of practice, backgrounds, but working in a whole variety of different settings. And they're doing some meaningful work, uh, teaching us how to put on some great programs, but also on the public service side. I've always been a public service sort of person and, you know, and, and how we can better connect doing pro bono work or other work to help our communities, especially communities of color and, and other backgrounds. And I just said, this is really cool. And what was great, and I didn't know it at the time was, I became a go-to in LA for a lot of my peers who didn't know any other lawyers in LA. So I would get the call 
if someone's looking for a lawyer for XYZ matter and whether I could do the work or someone at my firm could do the work or I could refer it out, I became someone that was a go-to. And so the ABA had unique business development potential, different from local bar. And not that you couldn't get it from local bar, it's just different. And so I slowly over the course of time and now, um, and I should have mentioned that earlier in business development and networking, but now it's become a huge source of client work, but that's not why I do it. I love the work. I love the people. I think when people see you working in a bar association group or a nonprofit board or whatever you're passionate about, they observe you and they observe a lot of your skill set that can translate to, wow, that person must be an amazing lawyer when they're you know, working in a legal case. I'm going to call them. I trust them. I, I trust their judgment. I trust their approach to ethical things. I love the way they problem solve. I'm going to reach out and whether they can do the work or they refer it to somebody else. Um, it's really been amazing. And so I think that we all need to really look at bar associations. I'm a big, big believer in bar associations. I think they have huge potential for lawyers. And I encourage, especially women, I encourage you to get involved uh, in whatever it is. Now, joining and getting involved are two different things. You can join 20 organizations, but getting involved is what will make a difference. And to your point, Carol, that's why I've kind of stuck it out with a couple of my organizations that I've spent a really long time in is because number one, you make relationships. Those grow over time. And there are so many different ways you can contribute within that organization. I care about my profession. I wanted to give back and I've been doing that, but I also wanted to try and lead over time um, because I had ideas, visions, not because I wanted to be chair of this or chair of that, but because I wanted to go in a certain direction. I wanted to accomplish certain things. And, and I thought that would be the way to, to do it. So I absolutely love the ABA. I will continue to be involved for as long as I can. And I, I've gotten so much out of it. And I would encourage everybody to get involved with either the ABA, Wallala, LA County Bar, whatever it is. But if you do it, treat it like you would treat a client. I, I said that about partners. I'm saying that about bar association work as well and community service work. If you commit to doing something, you do it and you do an amazing job. You spend time, you, you care about the quality of what you do and how you do it because you are being perceived and watched and observed and it could turn out to really be amazing for you. So you really, if you're gonna commit, you commit and you do a fabulous job like you do, would do on your client work. That's wonderful, Laura, thank you for that. So now that you have been in the ABA for I believe over 30 years, um, and not just you know joined it, but actively involved, including in various leadership roles on commissions. Um, you know, I'm, I want to talk about your personal observations on the state of the legal profession because I think you're well situated, given all of your experiences, not just in the community, which I still do want to talk a little bit about, but um, with you know some of the the big professional bar associations, especially ABA. So, what do you think, Laura? Um, are the biggest challenges and obstacles facing women in the legal profession today? And are they the same, different from what you encountered in your own professional career? I know this is a really huge, weighty um, topic, but I'm curious to see um, if, what thoughts you have on it. Well, interestingly, Carol, I um, this, this group that I've been involved in for now uh, almost two years, uh, the coordinating group on Practice Forward, we did a survey and hopefully we're gonna do another one as well, but this survey was eye-opening and it was taken of lawyers during the pandemic. And you know, our, goal, our whole role was we were a member facing group interested in figuring out what was happening with our profession during the pandemic, what our members needed and wanted and where we saw this heading. And it was eye-opening because we realized women were leaving the profession or wanting to leave the profession in droves. And it was very frightening when I, when I saw some of these statistics. But we also tried to identify ways to deal with the reasons, the causes for what's happening right now. One of which, which I'm still hugely um, a believer in is childcare. Mm -hmm. Childcare and family care policies. And we advocated in the House of Delegates of the ABA, our policy, and I was proud that we did this, 
to go with the US Chamber of Commerce, by the way, he was lobbying Congress for this as well, because they realized from an economic perspective, when you have all these women leaving not just our profession, but other professions as a whole, you're going to impact the economy. So we got to do something here to support women so they can work. And when you're at home and you have children and you've got all these obligations and you're trying to balance everything and, and trying to get it done in a hybrid work environment or remote work environment, it becomes very, very difficult, uh, especially with younger, younger children and, and lack of support systems. So that's something that we've been advocating for and lobbying for. And I believe that until we have solid policies and, and we also, um, uh, the ABA's policy dealt with employ legal employers, so law firms. We were, that was the space we were focused on. We believe that law firms need to have excellent child care support, whether it's vouchers or just policy or allowing for flexibility or whatever is needed if they want to retain and recruit women um, who unfortunately still have the primary you know, caregiver role. I say unfortunately because I believe that uh, men should be sharing it and I'm blessed because mine have. I mean, my, my husband's been phenomenal. I don't have young children, I have older children, but I cannot imagine having gone through this with younger children. I don't know how anyone does this um, without some form of support. So I, we have seen that trend has been very disturbing and I'm hopeful that it will change. I think a lot of women are really taking stock and looking at their lives and saying, you know, is this the life I want? Is this how I want to practice law? Or maybe I should be looking for a different arrangement that, that works better for me, whatever that looks like. And, and so I think that we're gonna see some huge changes in our profession and not just for women. I think just generally, especially uh, newer lawyers and younger lawyers who, who you know, have, some, it falls on men too, the caregiving responsibility, but also the people that are taking care of their parents. You've got the family care dynamic, especially in communities of color. We also saw, and I mean, for me, you know, we, my, we don't kick out our, our kids unless you know, they're ready to leave. And same with our parents, a lot of us live together. And I think that might be more of a, a Latinx thing or you know, could be an Asian culture, could be a variety of cultural backgrounds. The, the, the perspective of what family means and how it works and how we live together is maybe a little bit different. Uh, but in any event, I think that family care piece is huge as well because that takes a lot of time and energy and especially with this pandemic, it, it's, it's brought new public health and just health concerns to the, to the surface and how we approach taking care of each other and whether it's COVID related or not COVID related, it's impacted all of us. And so I think that, you know, there's been a lot of eye opening. The other thing we've seen is we've seen an acceptance of remote work like we've never seen it before. You know, in the past it was kind of, you know, I mean, it was sort of stereotyped and you, you, you know, you might've been seen as more of a second class person. You weren't as committed or you weren't as engaged or whatever the stereotypes were. And, you know, it was, it was kind of, you know, it was a negative connotation. Um, and we have worked to try and remove that and to say, hey, there's nothing wrong with remote work, especially if you've seen the courts and, you know, the progress they've made and allowing, you know, remote appearances and whether it's video or, or by phone call, even though we had court call before the pandemic. Um, I think that more of that is going to happen. We're going to see more changes and advances because of technology. Thank goodness for technology that's really, I think, allowed us to stay involved and active and engaged during the pandemic. You know, and I think that will develop as well. But I think some good things. So we got to look at silver linings too. Some good things have come out of this. A lot of us have gotten much more time to spend with our families that we hadn't in the past. It's like you know, you get caught up in sort of that rat race, and, and what does it look like? And you know, moving, 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 constantly going, going, going. And gosh, sitting down with your kids and having a meal on a regular basis. Oh my gosh, how awesome has that been? It's been phenomenal. Um, I mean, I had the kids home for a good while because both of my kids have now graduated college. But I, I just say that, that we need to be flexible. We need to be open because there are going to continue, in my view, to be changes in our profession. And I just pray and hope that we take the right steps so that women in particular, um, and then the double whammy women of color can, can also uh, continue to contribute in whatever way um, works. And one other bit of advice that I like to give Carol is, and I'm a big believer in this, is don't settle. Don't settle for, you know, okay, well, this is okay. It's not exactly what I want. I think that if you want it and you spend the energy to find it, you will be able to find it. Whatever that work environment happens to be. Uh, big firms are awesome. They're not for everybody. 
Um, there's mid-sized firms, there's small firms, there's solo, there's in-house, there's so many ways to use your legal skills and your legal um, acumen that contribute. And so I am a believer and I'm committed to, you've got to pursue whatever makes you happy and don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. Well, Laura, so it's so great to hear that you and the ABA have been on the child care issue because that definitely sounds like has been a major cause of, I think, what's been dubbed the she session. A lot of women leaving um, the, the workforce, not just in the legal industry, but uh, frankly, uh, across all industries um, during the pandemic. So what about pay equity? Just to throw another big topic at you. Um, does it, is that something that we're moving in the right direction? Uh, does it look like, you know, that uh, society is becoming, you know, more receptive um, to the idea that, frankly, there should be parity uh, in pay between men and women? You know, I think that what's happened during the pandemic, Carol, is actually going to be helpful in that area because I think that as soon as you accept and acknowledge there's different ways of performing work and being successful and defining what success actually means, that you're going to value the work in a different way than I think maybe historically we have. I'm always the eternal optimist, I must confess, Carol, I'm always that way. Uh, but I do think that some of the laws um, have helped and how we implement the laws and pursue them I, I think that we need to be cognizant of that. I mean, in, in, in a law firm environment, you know, we need to be particularly cognizant of contributions that are not the traditional contributions. I know that in, in my firm, we look at everything someone does. It's not just how you've affected the bottom line directly, but maybe indirectly. You know, um, how many other lawyers are you keeping busy? What kind of contributions to the community have you made? And maybe they're non-traditional a ways of getting you know a business in or or getting involvement in or getting the firm name out you know there's different ways to reward and to treat people um, and so I think it really varies uh, I feel very fortunate in my firm because we are lockstep and it's based on seniority so far it's worked over the course of more than a hundred years not all firms can be built that way and I understand that but I do think that the way that we value everybody's contribution needs to go into the mix. And the more people that have that approach and that attitude at the decision-making table, that's when those decisions that have huge impact will occur. And I think we just can't, we need to, we can't relent. We have to keep at this. We have to keep at it and keep advocating and keep monitoring and advocating where it's appropriate for, uh, for that pay equity because if we don't do this, if we don't continue to be vigilant about it, uh, we won't achieve what I think we need to achieve. I do think there have been steps in the, in the positive column. I think we have been making progress, but I think there's other places and work environments where, where we take one step forward and it feels like we're taking two steps backward. And so we just, we just can't give up. Uh, and we have to figure out how, how those decisions are made and how to impact who is making those decisions and whether that's different models, different approaches, uh, you know, whatever it is. And I, and I do think that the bar associations are, are well situated to work on these projects and to assist as needed, uh, you know, and if there have to be more tweaks or changes in terms of the laws and to advocate for those as well. So Laura, you talked about, you know, being the ever optimist um, and you uh, clearly also um, are confident and you, the advice you've been giving um, to our audience has been great. I wanna talk a little bit about imposter syndrome and uh, specifically whether or not, um, you know, despite being the optimist and being confident uh, and being very proactive, um, whether you've ever experienced it, uh, where do you still experience it? And how do you how do you combat it? And this will be especially hopefully helpful to some of the younger, uh, members in our audience. Oh, I absolutely have had that experience, the imposter syndrome. I mean, I've probably had it more recently than <laughs> I would even imagine. I'm, you know, I mean, I can think of when I'm sitting in a boardroom and I come up with an idea and it kind of, no one really reacts. And then the male person sitting next to me, literally, literally five minutes later has come up with the identical idea. And all of a sudden it's brilliant. 
And so you know what I do now, Carol? I, uh, I've learned this and I'm gonna give this tip to you because I want everybody to use this as needed. Oh gosh, John, thank you for validating my idea. I so appreciate it. It just means so much that we're on the same page. And I, I just thank you for that support. I really, I can't tell you what that means. Boom, done. You got to do these kind of things. And you might feel like, gosh, I don't belong here. Why am I here? I'm not worthy. Why, why am I sitting here? You know, and experiences like that sometimes try to reinforce in your mind, reinforce that. You know, I, I really, this isn't me. I don't, who is this person? Who is embodying this person? Who's sitting here? And should I even have the right to be at this table? You know, when I was president of the Tournament of Roses, um, there were times where I'm thinking, my gosh, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why, how did I get to this point? How am I leading? And then I would quickly just realize, you know what, Laura, there are going to be times, I say to myself, where you just got to do what you've got to do. And you've got to say what you've got to say. And it may not be popular and it may not be, you know, the, the way that other people would do it, but you go, you go and you do what you have to do. And, and so that voice will creep into your head. And I, look, I've been doing this for 30 years and that voice still creeps into my head. So, so I'm validating the fact that it exists. It doesn't necessarily go away, but it's more how you manage it and how you deal with it. And, you know, you look around that table and you think, wow, these people are amazing. Well, guess what? You're amazing too. And you have to remind yourself of that. You are amazing. You earned it. You earned those roles, those positions. You've got you to literally do that in your mind. You've got to do that for yourself. But that support system can play a role as well. So, so there's different ways to manage it. But part of it is just get out of your head and realize, look, I deserve this. Tell yourself wh whatever you have to do to realize I deserve to be here. And guess what? I deserve to have an opinion. And guess what? My opinion may be very different from most of the people sitting around this table. And guess what? That's okay. That's part of being authentic. That's part of being yourself. And that's part of making a unique and different contribution, which is the reason you're there. They want, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, the reason you were chosen is because of your different experience and different viewpoint. And that is a strength and should never be viewed as anything other than a strength and a powerful statement. And don't let those naysayers around you, and I believe me, I still deal with those naysayers around me or negativity, whatever it is. Don't let them bring you down. Don't get sucked into it. Don't buy into it. You are who you are. And you say what you got to say and you do what you got to do. And I think that that attitude will, will bode well and will serve you well if you can maintain that focus and make sure you do your homework, make sure you have backup for, you know, if you're giving an opinion or a position or whatever it is, just think it through and be prepared, prepared, prepared. You cannot over-prepare. You can't over-prepare for court, for your hearings, for your cases. Same for sitting in a board meeting or sitting in a, in a group conversation or whatever it is, or a bar association committee be prepared and you will impress the heck out of everyone, whether you know it or not, and whether they want to admit it or not. Laura, I have to say, I am so blown away by you. I wish we could have a pocket, Laura, that everybody has that we could just sort of put in our pocket wherever we go. And you're just always such, so positive and such, such an empowering person. I love it. And um, it's so great. I think for the audience to hear all of your advice, um, so I, I do want to talk a little bit because I, I, I uh, the Tournament of Roses, the fact that you were uh, the third female president, first uh, Latina, I will say that I have uh, watched uh, the Rose Parade uh, from as when I was a little kid, I've gone to watch it in person on the streets. I know I've read about how you uh, and your family uh, also had uh, camped out uh, when you were younger and to watch it. Um, so that, the 2021, I have to say, was one of my favorites. And I'm not saying it just because you're sitting here in front of me, uh, but for a whole host of things. It was so, talk about authentic, having now spent a little bit of time talking to you. Um, you put your own stamp on it, clearly. Um, I wanted you to describe a little bit how that experience was, but talking a little bit also about, you know, being the first and then being the third, um, whether or not that can be both, right, super empowering, uh, but it could also, uh, for, a, you know, having a woman placed in that kind of situation, having anybody placed in a situation as, you know, being a first, it could also, frankly, be 
um, you know, daunting, right? Because in some ways I'm wondering, did you have, um, feel a bigger sense of responsibility uh, as a first, you know, this idea that, hey, I better really, you know, bring my A game because I am a first. And if I failed, I'm not really just taking myself down. Uh, and I did, it doesn't strike me that you would ever think this way, but that you would also be bringing down a lot of others, you know, whether it's Latinx or women, just out of curiosity. Well, I think you, you make an amazing point and a, and a question, Carol, because yes, I did feel a huge amount of responsibility, but I also embraced it and said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to beg for forgiveness instead of asking for permission. <laughs> You've heard that phrase a million times, variety of people. And, you know, I did do some things that I'm sure uh, some folks thought it was over the top, you know, but my view was I was going to have that, what we call that Latin flavor, eh, el gusto, <laughs> you know, um, it was gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna be surrounding everything we did. But it wasn't just, um, you know, Latin flavor. It was diversity. It was diversity generally. I mean, we had one of the most diverse uh, parades that we've had in I don't know how long. I mean, I, I would, I would argue history, but I don't want to, I don't want to go there because I'm not trying to compare. But I mean, we had bands. Uh, we had an all-female marching band. You know, from um, uh, you know Europe. Uh, Copenhagen. We had a, a Japanese composite band, and then we had a lot of bands from Latin America. We had, uh, and then we had a, a U.S. territory. We had Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. We had Costa Rica. We had Mexico and El Salvador, and and that was a statement in and of itself, uh, because a lot of these kids have never left their countries, let alone gotten a plane to perform on the biggest stage. We impacted their communities because we gave them economic vibrancy, like Costa Rica. They would come and practice on a weekly basis. And they said to me, what are we going to do when this band is no longer in the parade? I said, you're going to find another project because all of their, their restaurants were busy. The businesses were busy. And I mean, nobody realizes the impact that this parade has all over the world. I mean, it's huge. And then we had amazing stories all over the country. We had um, bands from, the, uh, from Mississippi. Uh, we had a band that survived Hurricane Katrina and their school was formed as a result of it. We had a band from Pearland, um, Texas, outside of Houston, um, who also recovered you know, um, from um, Hurricane Harvey. And I mean, all of these compelling, amazing stories. We had Southern University, HBCU, which now we're gonna have every year an HBCU band. We had two, because we had the first African-American president the year before me. We had two that year and we had one my year. And we're, every year from now on, we're gonna have an HBCU presence. I mean, there's so much that we did to embrace the vibrancy and diversity of our community, of our state, our country and our world. And I was not going to not, let that happen. And, and, and plus, we also, um, a lot of people think it's just a parade in a game, and it's way more than a parade in a game. I mean, we, we do so much in the community, and we did way more. We, we opened up, we had a community reception, we opened our doors and invited the community in. Instead of always going out, we said, we're going to bring everybody in. And so we, we, we did a variety of things. Now we're doing Dia de los Muertos celebration. We have a Latino Heritage Parade. We have an African American uh, Black History Parade. Um, we're doing things uh, you know, in terms of Asian Asian American involvement, uh, we have a, a Better Together initiative. We have so many things, a Youth Empowerment Summit, so many things in the community that we're doing. And, um, you know, we, we are involved with scholarships, uh, essay contests for, for local community children. We also give money to the National Football Foundation. And I'm proud to say that I am now serving as one of, there's only been one other woman that's had this role the chair of the Rose Bowl Management Committee. So now I'm on the game side and that's a five-year gig. Not every past president gets to do this. And I sit at a table with the Big 10 commissioner and the Pac-12 commissioner and three athletics directors from each of the conferences. And we all go over college football and trends and name, image and likeness and Alston and all of these decisions. And now with college football CFP expansion, we're having conversations and I am front and center involved with all of this as well as other representatives of the tournament and these, uh, these other partners of ours. And so uh, doors have opened, opportunities have arisen because of, of this. And what's great is when I joined the tournament in the 90s, there were protests going on mm -hmm. for lack of diversity in the Tournament of Roses because it was all white men and they all wore white suits. And I never saw myself being one of those people because I didn't see anyone like me in that role. And so during those protests, that's when I joined because a whole bunch of us joined and said, you know what? The only way we're going to change this organization is by joining and getting involved and getting active. Now, I never joined with the idea that I would lead it. 
I just wanted to you know, be involved and make a difference and thought it would be fun. And when I joined, they added five at-large positions to our executive committee. So those were supposed to represent underrepresented, underserved communities. And so it changed the dynamic of how decisions were made because they had five seats with the same votes at the table. They were two-year terms. They weren't going up the ladder because it takes eight years to go up the ladder, which is a lot of preparation. And so um, I served as an at-large before I ever went up the ladder on the other side. Uh, number one, I don't think I ever would have had the opportunity if they hadn't seen me at that table and I hadn't taken advantage, even though I did have imposter syndrome at the time, thinking, what am I doing here with all these older white men? <laughs> what am I going to, what kind of contributions am I going to make? But I decided, you know what, I'm just going to speak my mind as politely and as professionally as I can. And I did. And fortunately, in 2012, I was asked to, to, uh, to join the executive committee and eventually be president in 2020. And it gave me eight years to plan. And what's great about our group is we're the ultimate equalizer. People come from all backgrounds, all walks of life, but we're never going to put someone in this position who is not prepared to lead. We have make sure that by the time you are at number eight, go from number eight to number one, you have touched every operating committee of our organization. There's 32 operating committees by either having served on it or coordinated it. And so that's what happened. But then I needed to add my own flavor. So for the first time, we had never had a Latina Grand Marshal, believe it or not. So what did I do? I picked three <laughs> from three generations to appeal to a variety of people, Rita Moreno, Gina Torres, and Lori Hernandez. And my daughter knew who Lori Hernandez was. She knew who kind of knew who Gina Torres was, and she didn't know who Rita Moreno was. My parents knew who Rita Moreno was. So that was intentional. We had distinguished guests. We had never had distinguished guests. That was one of those asking for, I mean, uh, begging for forgiveness versus asking for permission <laughs> moments. And so, you know, we had Jaime Jarin, uh, the Spanish broadcaster for Dodgers, um, you know, the Dodgers team. Um, uh, uh, we had um, Elena uh, Torres, one of the uh, first Latina astronaut. Um, just really, really special stuff. Um, and we had um, uh, Sonia from um, Sesame Street who played Maria. Um, so, you know, it was just, there were so many opportunities and special moments. Um, both on the front end and the back end of the parade and in the, uh, the game. And I just treasured that opportunity. I did feel a strong sense of responsibility. I'm thrilled that this will continue, this diversity. We have a woman who will be installed literally later today um, as the fourth woman uh, leader. We have another one going up the ladder. We have an openly gay uh, person who will be um, uh, leading our organization and another and the first Latino who will lead in two more years. So clearly, and, another, and the second African American who serves on now. So clearly, uh, we are starting to organically reflect our community, which was way overdue. And I'm thrilled that I also was able to, to talk to the Spanish press. That's something that we have not done on any regular basis in Spanish. And so I took advantage of Univision and being able to share a lot on the cultural side and having interviews done and, and a bunch of other opportunities done to promote the amazing bands that we had, but also the Sabor Latino, as I mentioned, um, that, we were, that we were trying to bring in addition to other forms of diversity to the Rose Parade. And uh, I'm thrilled that I had the opportunity. I'm thrilled that we have started something that you know, is, we're never turning back from my perspective. And I'm also thrilled to be involved with the Rose Bowl game in the way that I will be for the next several years. Laura, I loved everything about that. And I had so many follow-up questions about that. Uh, but I, I do want to get uh, to one other big topic in the few minutes that we have. I will say that the messaging from you, including from that last response, was own the big responsibility that you get and make it your own, uh, as it sounds like you clearly did. And that's so amazing. So in the few minutes that we had, and I, I, I didn't lie to you, did I, Laura? When I said at the beginning, I, we could talk for hours, right? So yes. but I do want to I do want to make sure we get to this topic, which is, you know, everybody knows this quote, Madden Albright, I think maybe even recently, uh, Taylor Swift said this, there's a special place in hell for women who do not help other women. And there's so much to unpack from this quote. Um, I'm going to do one of my, you know, uh, compound questions and have you uh, pick and choose whatever you want to answer out of this. Uh, I think it'll save a little bit of time. But there is a lot to unpack from this quote, right? Um, because there's, it's almost embedded in it, this idea that there's a special obligation of women to help out each other. Um, do you think that is true? 
Uh, do you think it plays into gender stereotypes about women, you know, being more help helpful and empathetic? Does this put an extra burden uh, on women doesn't put on that that's not placed upon men? Also, not to, you know, uh, to make it even harder. Also, do you, are women really tougher on each other? Um, have you experienced this? And then finally, uh, if there's a finally, can you speak? You've already talked about so many different things you've already done to help and train uh, other women. But this is also a very big one. I, I know that this four part question could really be, um, you know, a, a five hour uh, conversation, but I really would love to hear your thoughts about this, this idea of sisterhood, right? Uh, we've talked a little bit about already uh, the idea that uh, there are male mentors and sponsors out there. Uh, and that, you know, this, this idea of sisterhood though, um, is that, is it possible to build a sisterhood, um, you know, with class and race complications? Uh, in terms of building a sisterhood? And also, you know, how do we get buy-in from the men who might not be currently buying in? So that might actually be a 20-part question, Laura, but I'll let, you <laughs> I'll let you decide how to answer it, you know, in the, in the time that, that, the few minutes that we have and however way you want to. Okay, well, yes, it's a lot to unpack, but I'm happy to unpack it. I, I do think that women have a uh, responsibility to bring other women up. I think women of color have a responsibility to bring other women of color up as well. I think men have a responsibility to bring women and women of color and men of color up. Um, but the question is, will they do it? And sometimes you need to do what you've got to do to kind of remind them that they have to play part of it because I don't think you can do it alone. You have to have allies. You absolutely have to have allies. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean you don't speak up. It doesn't mean you don't take action. It doesn't mean you don't do what you have to do and, and pursue and remind people when they're not being inclusive, when they're not being diverse and equitable and focusing on DEI and how important it is. But you need to build bridges while you go there. You don't want to isolate yourself because if you isolate yourself, you're always going to be seen as that one issue person or that one moment person or, oh gosh, that's all she ever brings up is diversity. Here we go again. You know, don't get me wrong. It's hugely important, but it's the way you do it. It's, it's, it's the how that I think is crucial here. It's, it's building those allyships, building it from an organic standpoint, from a substantive standpoint. You know, you, you want to say this person is X, Y, and Z and deserves X, Y, and Z. And they bring this, this, and this to the table. And this is an extra bonus you know, or whatever it is, however you pursue it. But the point is, you can't be a one issue person, because I think that you turn people off, and you won't get the support that you're seeking and that you're, you're, you're wanting to promote. So I, I, I do believe in the obligation and the responsibility. It's how you implement it, how you use it that I think is crucial. And, and from my experience, I have found that I am more successful when I use the ally model and the substantive model. And I've done my homework and I've done my research and I am making sure that we are doing what we need to do. Now, that being said, if I see a group of nominees for whatever the organization is, and I don't see enough diversity in that group, I'm gonna say something. Darn right, I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna say, wait a minute, have we forgotten? Are, do, are you gonna sit here and tell me and literally think that I'm going to believe that there are no women or people of color qualified for this role. Don't even try that with me. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that that's no, that's not happening. So, you know, you need to call it what it is when it is, but you try to be collaborative. You try not to put people on the defensive. You try to be, you know, work as allies when you can and when it's appropriate to do what you got to do. But I have found that when I call people out, I try to do it on a one-on-one. -on -one. I don't try to embarrass people in a group setting um, necessarily because you're not going to necessarily gain a lot of traction unless you've got to speak up. I mean, there are times where you say, okay, wait a minute. If somebody crossed the line, you know, that's a little bit different. But hopefully we can do enough proactive where we, we are actually making an impact and making a difference and then keeping track of it. But making sure also that whoever you bring up understands their obligation to continue to do the same because you you can say to them sit down look this is what I did um, you know I did everything I could and, and we worked together and we accomplished this what are your plans now to do the same you know what did what are your approaches what ideas do you have 
so that we can do this. I want to be in a position, Carol, like everybody does, where I don't have to worry in the future about this happening or not happening. I want it to be an automatic. I want it to be a course. This is always part of the equation. And I, I live for that moment. And I'm hopeful that at some point that will happen. And I, I, really, I really would love to see that. Um, will it happen? I don't know. Um, but, but everything that I have done and will continue to do will be with the idea to try and make sure that it does. And I think we all have to approach this issue in whatever way we're comfortable. Once again, I keep coming back to the authenticity because if you don't believe this in your heart, it will show. And so you have got to be committed to what you think is right. And if you're questioning some of this, then I think you need to have a moment where you've got to say, well, should I really even be in this position? Should I really pursue this if I'm not committed to making sure that I am making the kind of change that allowed my opportunity to occur in the first place. Because if I'm not committed to this, I have to start questioning, well, maybe I'm not in the right spot or maybe I need to be doing something different. So I, I check myself on a regular basis. Am I really focused on the right thing? Now that being said, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna support every woman or every person of color that comes into that pipeline. Because there may be some where I just say, you know what? I'm not sure that that person is the best person for whatever the reason is. So it's not an automatic. And that's the thing that has bothered me also because there have been times in my life in different organizations where someone would look and say, well, how come you didn't support that you had a woman versus a man in this instance and you didn't support the woman? Because the woman I didn't think was worthy of the support, period. I'm not gonna support a woman just because she's a woman. I, I'm gonna support a woman because she's the right choice. And she's substantively ready. And same with the person of color. You know, you have an obligation, in my view, to work on the pipeline. <laughs> That's where I think the major work exists, is we want to have a pipeline of people that are prepared, that are substantively ready, that are willing, able, or to learn so that we can put people in those positions. And so that's what I believe in, in, in a huge way, is making sure that that pipeline is filled so that nobody can, can look at you and say, gee, there wasn't anybody qualified. I, I, I just, that, if you wanna talk about a peeve, that's my peeve, I don't wanna go there. So I know I've, I've, I don't know if I've answered all aspects of your question. You can remind me if there's something else that I, that I missed because I know there was a lot to it. Let me know, Carol, if there's anything that, else that I should be addressing with that question. No, Laura, I thought that was fantastic. Um, you are such a force of nature. And I'm, I have to say, I'm not surprised that you pick power of hope as the theme, because you seem to be such a, you know, a, a force of positivity and optimism, uh, and so great for the legal profession. I've uh, obviously uh, undersold the amount of time we talk about, you know, today. So I want to give you any You've given so many great pieces of practical advice to the audience out there, but uh, I want to give you the opportunity for any any other things that we haven't covered that you think um, is worth um, mentioning to our audience. You know, and, and our audience is going to include right um, attorneys who are young and starting out to those who might be. Um, you know, women who have uh, been in the profession for quite some time now and feel a little stuck, right? They don't really know what the next chapter is. Any last parting pieces of advice that um, you haven't already already told? I would say life is too short. So definitely pursue um, whatever you think is, is crucial uh, for you. Um, don't settle again. And if you are looking to do something into the future, that you know that maybe you haven't felt comfortable doing because i think this pandemic has actually brought a lot to the to the table in terms of how we approach life and how we see life and i think you need to live life to the fullest you want to be a fulfilled human being so if you've always thought about pursuing x y and z but you haven't done it do it try it try it i mean try things be courageous be brave you know, don't let, like I said before, don't let other people dictate those parameters for you. Don't let other people tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing. Pursue what you need to pursue or pursue what you've always wanted to pursue, you know, because then you won't live with regrets. Even if it doesn't work out, it, it's still something you can say, you know what? I tried it and I really tried it. I put my all, I put everything I had into, into X, Y, Z, whatever that looks like. And it does take courage. It, it does take some bravery and it may take 
doing something that takes you a little bit out of your comfort zone. But guess what? That's how wonderful things happen. That's how change occurs, sometimes crucial change. If you haven't had the opportunity to really pursue what's in your heart and what you're passionate about, then ask yourself, am I impacting the world the way I should be? Because each one of us can leave this world better than we found it and can make such a difference and can really contribute. And so I challenge all of you to look deep inside in your life, whether you're new, whether you're stuck, or whether you're about to retire or move on to, an, you know, one door closes, another door opens, whatever it looks like. Look at your life and say, you know what? Is there something that I've never done that I really want to do or that I'm interested in that I haven't tried yet? Try it. Figure it out. Call somebody in that space. Call me. You know, let me know. I'll talk with you. I'll talk with anyone. You know, I really believe that, that we have to do what we can to become happy, personally fulfilled people. And you are the only one that can make yourself happy. Laura Farber, what powerful world words. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Carol. It was an absolute pleasure.